the choices you make and specifically the way you choose to see God matters. How you choose to interpret the circumstances of your life matters because what you choose to believe about Him is who you'll show others that He is. Will you choose to see Him through the eyes of fear and doubt or through the understanding of a God who not only loves us, but is love? Join me today as we learn to see Him rightly, as we learn to choose love. Hi everyone, welcome back to Choose Love. And I am so excited that you wanna um, take the time and spend time in the Word with me today. So we're just gonna pray and get right into it. I found um, some old notes from a, a year or so back that I really wanted to revisit called One Compelling Focus. So if this sounds familiar, if you've been following me for a while, then, then this will be a little bit familiar, but it felt like it was important to revisit. So Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for your presence that's with each one of us where we are right now. We give you permission to just speak truth to our hearts. We're hungry for you. We're, we're listening for what you want to say to each one of us. Um, and we just say to you, I need you. I need you today. I need what you want to speak to me. I need, um, I need the love and the peace and the light and the life that you are so happy to, to give me and to pour into me. So I receive it now. And I just open my heart and my ears to see you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're going to go into Philippians chapter 3. Philippians was written by um, Paul. And before he was Paul, he was Saul. And actually, this is written from Paul and Timothy. Um and he's writing to a group of people that were called the Philippians. And um, it was a group of believers there that he would periodically go and visit and minister to. And I love how this letter that he writes to them, he's so vulnerable. And he just, he just speaks from, you know, where he's come from and and speaks as a father in the faith to them. So we want to hear his heart. And uh, specifically, there are some, some things I want to highlight, but I'm just going to jump in. I'm going to read this chapter to you and then make some comments. So a call to rejoice and a warning. Now this is from the Passion Translation. My beloved ones, don't ever limit your joy or fail to rejoice in the wonderful experience of knowing our Lord Jesus. I don't mind repeating what I've already written you because it protects you. Beware of those religious hypocrites who teach you that you should be circumcised to please God. For we have already experienced heart circumcision. And when we worship God in the power and freedom of the Holy Spirit, not in laws and religious duties, we are those who boast in what Jesus Christ has done and not in what we can accomplish in our own strength. It's true that I once relied on all that I had become. I had a reason to boast and impress people with my accomplishments more than others, for my pedigree was impeccable. I was born a true Hebrew of the heritage of Israel as the son of a Jewish man from the tribe of Benjamin. I was circumcised eight days after my birth and was raised in the strict tradition of Orthodox Judaism, living a separated and devout life as a Pharisee. And concerning the righteousness of the Torah, no one surpassed me. I was without a peer. Furthermore, as a fiery defender of the truth, I persecuted the Messianic believers with religious zeal. Yet all of the accomplishments that I once took credit for, I've now forsaken them, and I regard it all as nothing compared to the delight of experiencing Jesus Christ as my Lord. To truly know Him meant letting go of everything from my past and throwing all my boasting on the garbage heap. It's all like a pile of manure to me now. 
so that I may be enriched in the reality of knowing Jesus Christ and embrace him as Lord in all of his greatness. My passion is to be consumed with him and not cling to my own righteousness based in keeping with written law. My only righteousness will be his based on the faithfulness of Jesus Christ, the very righteousness that comes from God. And I continually long to know the wonders of Jesus and to experience the overflowing power of his resurrection working in me. I will be one with him in his sufferings and become like him in his death. Only then will I be able to experience complete oneness with him in his resurrection from the realm of death. I admit that I haven't yet acquired the absolute fullness that I'm pursuing, but I run with passion into his abundance so that I may reach the purpose for which Christ Jesus laid hold of me to make me his own. I don't depend on my own strength to accomplish this. However, I do have one compelling focus. I forget all of the past as I fasten my heart to the future instead. I run straight for the divine invitation of reaching the heavenly goal and gaining the victory prize through the anointing of Jesus. So let all who are fully mature have this same passion. And if anyone is not yet gripped by these desires, God will reveal it to them. And let us all advance together to reach this victory prize, following one path with one passion. My beloved friends, imitate me in my walk with God and follow all those who walk according to the way of life that we modeled before you. For there are many who live by different standards. As I've warned you many times, I weep as I write these words. They are enemies of the cross of the anointed one, and doom awaits them. Their God, little g, their God, has possessed them and made them mute. Their boast is in their shameful lifestyles, and their minds are in the dirt. But we are a colony of heaven on earth as we cling tightly to our life giver, the Lord Jesus Christ who will transform our humble bodies and transfigure us into the identical likeness of his glorified body. And using his matchless power, he continually subdues everything to himself. Wow, there's so much in this chapter. I'm pretty sure I'm going to want to come back to it in another part two. But um, what I want to focus on out of this passage today is um, this idea of one compelling focus. Um, you know, in life, there are so many things that distract us or just grab our attention, and, and many of them are things that need our attention. But I just, you know, want to be able to look back over my life, however long or short my life ends up being. And I want to know that over all of it, there was one compelling focus. You know, it's, it's, it's hard when you're, when you're sitting in literal, you know, comfort or lack of comfort, depending on how your life is going right now. And, and, feel like there's something else that matters more, right? Um, and that's, I think, the, the big tension of life is that everything around us screams for our attention. Everything around us feels so real, you know, especially the more our feelings are involved and our feelings give us the sense that nothing else matters than what we're feeling in that moment. Um, or the the passions that we're pursuing, the things we're working hard at to, to accomplish or do or get over. But the, the truth is when you sit still long enough to connect with um, what I would call eternity 
in, I forget what scripture, it's, um, I believe it's Ecclesiastes that says, he has written eternity on our hearts. And so when you sit still long enough, and the enemy hates for us to sit still in our, in our minds especially, he wants to keep everything so chaotic and so swirling that we can't come back to that place of our hearts where God has, has written eternity into our hearts, meaning, at least partially meaning, that when we're still, we can get in touch with the fact that there is something that actually matters more than all that we're feeling. There is something that is more real than all that we're experiencing here. And so that's my first challenge to you. You know, I never know who's who's watching these episodes, these programs. Um, and, you know, I would assume that that at least occasionally there are some that are watching who, you know, maybe you don't um, have a relationship with Jesus the way that you perceive others do, or maybe I do. Maybe Jesus for you is, um, you know, just, he was just a good man, like a religious man that, that makes you want to be better, right? Um, for those who have followed Jesus, who have said, I am centering my life around him, there is a core belief that he came as a man, but he was fully God when he came. And not only did he exist and live here on earth, but he walked in supernatural power and he laid his life down willingly, allowing, you know, humans, those he created to kill him so that he could become the sacrifice for us. And, you know, I'll get into that in another episode of just, um, you know, why we needed someone to be sacrificed for us? Why did we need someone to redeem our lives from sin? And I, I'm not going to get into the details of that today, but, um, you know, this, this Jesus that we talk about, for us, he's not just a historical figure. He is someone who is still alive and still um, seated in heaven but also seated in our hearts because we have invited him to be a part of our lives. And so um, when you hear someone talk about Jesus in a real way, it's because he is real. And if, if that's not your experience, maybe, maybe you've been raised in a Christian home and um, you would like to feel close to Jesus, but you just never really have then I would challenge you in the same way that I'll challenge somebody who maybe you weren't raised in a Christian home. Maybe Jesus is just, um, you know, a swear word that you've heard people use, but, you know, Christians talk a lot about him and Catholics, but, you know, other than that, you don't really understand much about Jesus. If he's real, and I know that he is, then he can reveal himself to you because he's God. And God responds to sincere, honest desire. And he goes where he's welcome. He goes where someone is, is interested in who he is and what he has to offer and what he has to say. And so I would encourage you to pray a dangerous prayer, but a good dangerous prayer how wherever you are in your relationship with Jesus or maybe you do know Jesus and you followed him for years but you want a deeper revelation of who he is i would challenge you to just um at some point on your own when you're quiet and you're still and you can get in touch with a sincere honest place in your own heart just say i if you're real <laughs> I want you to reveal yourself to me and I want you to do it in a way that I can't miss it, that I won't miss it. Because if you're God, then you know me well enough to know how I need to experience you in order for you to be real to me. 
And that is an honest, humble request that God will respond to. I've heard many, many stories where people have have asked that of God. And then and then you have to, you know, if if you're asking someone for um, if you're hungry and you're asking someone for food, you know, I, there were times when my kids would come through the kitchen and they'd be like, I'm hungry. And I knew them well enough to know, yeah, they just needed like a quick little snack. But there are times when they would come through the kitchen and I'm starving. What do we have to eat? And I'm like, I better make a meal. But in order to make a meal, it's going to take a little longer and you're going to have to get a little hungrier while I prepare for you um, something that will actually satisfy you. And the problem is we get so uncomfortable with hunger, even spiritual hunger, that we don't allow our spiritual appetite to increase to the capacity of what he has prepared for us to consume of who he is. And so we'll pray a prayer like that and we'll, you know, pretty honestly, you know, God, I need you. Where are you? But then you know, 10 minutes later or one day later, we don't feel like he's revealed himself to us. We feel like, well, I don't hear his voice. I didn't hear him speak to me. So we just keep filling that, that void and that, that hunger with other things. And then I believe, at least the God that I've come to know through the years, he waits. God is so patient and He's so patient that he doesn't even mind us going through all kinds of side paths and side journeys where where we experience some really painful things because, not because he's like, oh, they didn't get it right. They didn't pray the right way or ask the right way. No, out of his kindness and his love, he knows what he wants to give you, but he knows that your spiritual hunger, your spiritual appetite has to increase to the capacity of the feast of who he is that he longs to give you. So my point with that is if you pray that authentic, sincere prayer of if you are real, please reveal yourself to me. I do want to know you. Then don't don't satisfy yourself with temporary things. Don't run off to lesser loves. Any we, When we do that with all kinds of ways, we find other like, um, you know, teachings by other religious kinds of experiences. Um, you know, you'll people start reading into um, things that... that that I know from people that I've heard are a path to nowhere. You know, I don't want to talk bad about other religions, but I, I just know that, you know, for example, a lot of people will follow teachings of someone like Buddha or, um, you know, Muhammad or whatever. They, literally, for those of us that have been to Israel, like, you know, when you get there that Jesus isn't just some spiritual concept, like he literally lived there. He literally turned the world upside down with his short life so much so that he has been known by every generation since not just the Bible writes about him, but all kinds of historical documents, etc. But even more than that, the proof of all of the miracles and the supernatural things that he did and that people have done in his name since then are undeniable. But nothing can replace your own encounter with him. And so that's what I'm, I'm taking a long time to say, to say here is ask him for an encounter with him and he will do it but be patient and don't through that process of waiting for him. I will tell you, he is worth waiting for. He is the pearl of great price. Sell all, like say no to everything else until he reveals himself to you. You will never regret it. All right. And that's what Paul did here. So Paul was, he used to be Saul and he had this 
basically experience, encounter with Jesus. And maybe we'll get into that another time, but it was supernatural and it was undeniable for him personally. He had been so good at his religion that he was committed to squelching and putting out anything and anyone else that that tried to deny the legalism that he was so committed to. Legalism being the rules and the the regulations that he thought, wrongly thought, would get him closer to God. And, you know, we all find faults, um, lures that, that are faults that lead us away from truth and they look good and they seem right and they're not. And that's what, what Paul discovered. And he was Saul. He got a new name because he became totally a different person, a new person. And so a couple of things I want to just focus on here. This one compelling focus, verse 13. So he says in the verse before, I admit that I haven't yet acquired the absolute fullness that I'm pursuing. I love that. He's still hungry for more of what God wants to give to him. But I run with passion into his abundance so that I may reach the purpose for which Christ Jesus laid hold of me to make me his own. I don't depend upon my own strength to accomplish this. However, I do have one compelling focus. So he's saying, all right, I know better now than to believe wrongly that I have to do all these works to get close to God. No, it's through Jesus and what he's done for me that I can be close to God. It's not through me getting all these rules right. He says, and and so how does he accomplish it? If he's not accomplishing in his own strength, he says, this is how I do it. Number one, I have one compelling focus. So overarching everything else that seems so real He has this one compelling focus. It's that eternity that's written in our hearts. I forget. How does he do it? I forget all of the past as I fasten my heart to the future instead. Now, why is that so important? Why is that the the center focus for Paul, who who is a, a father in the faith to them at the time and to us even now? So this compelling focus, forgetting the past, is huge because think about what is in our past. In our past is a a trail of disappointment. In our past is a trail of offense, the people that have offended us. In our past are choices that we made along the way that Maybe we're reaping the consequences of today. In our past um, are things that have been done to us that have caused such profound heart um, wounds and heart um, unforgiveness in our hearts. And those places bind us. You know, um, if you didn't get an opportunity to see the movie come out in Jesus name. Um, Johnny and I got to see the premiere of that uh, about a week or so ago. And then I think just a couple of days ago, it was a showing in uh, one night only in 2000 theaters across the United States. And then they just announced that there's going to be a couple of other dates, I believe. Um, You can go to come out in Jesus name, I think.com. I'll have the link put in here. But it's it's a fascinating movie. You know, um, as a generation, we have kind of done, like all generations do, our pendulum swings back and forth. So years ago, maybe a generation or two ago, there was so much over-hyper-focus on the demonic. And Come Out in Jesus' Name is, is a, a documentary. I meant to tell you that. It's a documentary from Pastor Greg Locke 
where he tells the story of his journey from becoming a pastor who didn't believe in the demonic realm or casting out demons. And he certainly didn't believe that people who love God could have demonic oppression in their lives. And it, it explains the story of how that changed for him over the last year. And then how as a church, a local church here in Nashville, um, they began taking people through mass deliverance and specifically Christians who had opened doors in their lives and in their hearts to not becoming what we would think of as demon possessed, like you see in movies where, you know, people are possessed by demons. Um, and depending on how familiar you are with this subject, you know, you, you know that people can be completely demonized. Um, and certainly scripture makes that very clear. But Jesus also delivered people from demons, and then he taught his disciples to cast out demons. And then he said, those who follow me will cast out demons in my name. So hence the title of the documentary that's in theaters called Come Out in Jesus' Name. And so, all right, I wanted to give you the back, back story on that movie. But my reason for that um, is... For us, when we forget our past, there's a reason why we need to be aware that our past needs to be let go of so that we can move forward to the future. In our past, when these offenses come, and specifically what I want to want to highlight today is when we have a hard time forgiving someone, bitterness comes in. And bitterness and resentment and that hurt and that trauma left undealt with, you know, either you, you fester it, you know, like, and you just think about it and it kind of consumes you or you bury it so deep and you kind of compartmentalize it so that you can move on with your life that you don't even know it's there. So it can be one or the other, but either way, the key that unlocks that past trauma that's stored and the resentment and the bitterness that literally opens us up not to becoming demon possessed, but oppressed by a demon or multiple demons. How would you know if you're oppressed by demons? I'll give you a couple of, of hints. Do you feel um, tormented? Do you feel, you know, and people might use that word differently, like, um, do you feel like just these thoughts that just consume you? Do you feel like, not like normal, um, stressed out at times, but anxiety to the point where it debilitates you? It keeps you from enjoying life or enjoying your day. It's all consuming. It's something that you know, you would do anything to, to be done with, but it's been there maybe for so long that you don't even know who you are apart from it. You feel like it keeps you from being who you really want to be. And you live with like regret over and over and over again. Like, like, why am I like this? Or why is my life like this? That is a big major red flag, a hint that there is demonic oppression over you and over your life. And God did not create you to live under, underneath that. He created every single one of us to live free. We are spirit beings and our spirits are constantly interacting with the spirit realm that we cannot see, whether we recognize it and acknowledge it or not. It is the case. And the thing about the spirit realm is that you know, when God speaks to you, rarely would it ever be audible. I've heard of it, but I've never experienced it. But that that voice in our lives, it sounds an awful lot like our own thoughts, our own voice. And so it's hard to discern sometimes. Well, in the same way, the demonic realm and the enemy's voice through demons sounds an awful lot like our own voice right? Rarely would a demon or Satan speak audibly. I have heard for some people that that has happened. But 
because they're in the spirit realm, the only way they that their voice can intrude into our lives is through our own thoughts and our own voice. That's why our thoughts and what we speak are so important because we are literally either speaking words from God and from, you know, heavenly realm or words from the demonic realm, the enemy's plans and his heart for us. And when those get all jumbled up inside of us, we're unstable. We're unstable mentally, we're unstable emotionally, and we're unstable spiritually. And eventually, it plays out literally in our physical bodies. And there comes a time where we just want to throw it all off and get free. And if this resonates with you at all, get prayer. Find someone who has authority spiritually and get them to pray over you. I'll pray at the end, but there's nothing like that one-on-one experience where You get prayer from someone else and you get free. And the key to it is what Paul says here. I forget all of the past as I fasten my heart to the future. So the past, the way that we we forget it, you can't just will it away. It's called forgiveness. And, you know, I I do want to explore this more in future um, programs, but forgiveness, the most simple way to understand it is saying, you know, you're standing before God in a courtroom. There's someone with you who has done you wrong, like legit done you wrong. And forgiveness is saying, to God, the judge, and recognizing, God, you are the only one who can judge rightly because you are the only one who knows me from the inside out. And you're the only one who knows this person who wounded me, either intentionally, unintentionally, whatever the situation is. You're the only one that fully knows them and fully knows all of the intricacies of this situation. And so, I'm no, I'm taking myself and removing myself as the judge, the accuser. I'm saying, God, I acknowledge that you know, and I trust you to do the right thing concerning me and concerning this person and concerning this situation. It's out of my hands. I give it willingly to you. To me, that is the picture of forgiveness. It doesn't mean they didn't actually do something that was wrong. It doesn't mean that they shouldn't experience consequences because of it. It doesn't mean that you have to stay in relationship with that person in a way that they could hurt you again. But what it means is, God, let's do this your way. And I trust you because you are fair, you are righteous, and you're loving. You're loving to me and you're loving to this person. And so his love may or may not look like that person experiencing some serious consequences to what what they did to you. But the truth is, he's better at handling it than you are. And when you forgive, eventually that, that pain and that trauma that was connected to that, it leaves and, and more importantly, it does not give the demonic realm a legal right to your heart and to your life. When we do not forgive, it literally gives the demonic realm, our enemy, access to our heart, to our thoughts, even to our physical bodies. And, you know, we'll get into another time why that is the truth, but so how do we forget all of the past and fasten our heart to the future instead? He goes on to say it in the next verse. I run straight for the divine invitation of reaching the heavenly goal and gaining the victory prize through the anointing of Jesus. Through Jesus. It's all through Jesus. So full circle back to where we started. Have an encounter with him. It's only through Jesus that we can let go of the past and fasten our hearts to the future. And what's in the future is 
all that he wants to satisfy us with, all that he wants to feed our spirits with. So let all who are fully mature have this same passion. And if anyone is not yet gripped by these desires, God will reveal it to them. So that's what I want to pray for today, that God will cause us to be gripped with the the right desires. You know, even after walking this many years with God through my relationship with Jesus, I have so many other things that grip me, my own desires and desires for things that aren't bad necessarily, but that are just not the best that God has for me. They're, they're a distraction. And so I'm going to pray with you in a minute. We're going to pray through some of the unforgiveness, and we're going to pray that God would grip us with his desires by revealing Jesus to us. So a couple of quick um, questions that I have for you is, um, from the scripture, 2 Corinthians 5, 20. I'm not going to go there, but I'll just read it because I wrote it down here. We are ambassadors of the anointed one. Who's the anointed one? That's Jesus. So we are ambassadors, like we represent Jesus, who carry the message of Christ to the world as though God were tenderly pleading with them directly through our lips. So for those of us that do like have an intimate relationship with Jesus, it's got to spill over. And for those of you that you're you're wanting to know Jesus in a more powerful way, you know, you may ask, well, why can't I just know him on my own? Why do I have to be around others to um, grow spiritually, others who know Jesus? Well, <laughs> here it, it describes it. We are ambassadors. So those who do know him are ambassadors. Like he sent Jesus himself, one of the things, if you're asking Jesus, I want to know you, reveal yourself to me. If you're real, speak to me. One of the ways he does that is through others who already know him. So if, you know, you lived somewhere else and you sent a letter to me and said, I just really want to get to know you. And I took the time to send other people who actually know me to you and you refuse to interact with them so that you can benefit from the request that you asked me, like how, like that's foolish, right? It would be a, a, a sad thing if you missed it because you asked him to reveal himself to you, but yet you wouldn't allow him to reveal himself through those he sends to you. And God always sends people to you. You can barricade yourself in your own world, your own house, your own whatever. Eventually, you will have to come out of your own, you know, little world that you have and make an effort and step towards others who know him and actually become their friends, hear from their perspective who Jesus is and what he's like. It doesn't mean they're going to necessarily preach at you. You know, they may share through words, but more importantly, they will share through their lives. Because this, this verse here, 2 Corinthians 5.20 says, Carry the message of Jesus to the world as though God were tenderly pleading with them directly through our lips. That means because we're made in God's image as we come to know Christ, when we do something good or bad towards someone else, it registers on their heart as God himself doing it or saying it. That's huge. That means that you and I who do walk with Jesus and know him, we have the opportunity to allow others to experience what God is like and his heart towards them through us. And we get to be the ambassadors. We get to be the ones that go and say, he sent me because you said you wanted to know him. There was something in your heart that said, I need an encounter with the living God. 
And there's only one way to have an encounter with the living God. It is through Jesus and Jesus alone. Jesus is the only one. Jesus didn't, Jesus is the only one that lived here, that was sent by God from heaven, that was already fully God and became fully man. There is no other, as as wonderful as, as many other religious figures are, none of them are God himself. None of them were sent from God to the earth to, to live and die and give their lives so that we could know our Father God. And so think of what's at stake if you don't have an encounter with Jesus. What are you going to miss out on in this one lifetime? What are you going to miss out on? It's not worth not asking him from that authentic, sincere place. I want to know you, Jesus. So let's just pray. And for those of you that already know him, let's ask for another um, level of encounter and knowing him. Jesus, we just um, ask a dangerous request right now. It's dangerous because of the potential impact that it can have on us for the rest of our lives and all of eternity. If you're real, and I know that you are, I ask that you would reveal yourself in an ever-increasing way to every sincere heart before you right now. And God, I pray for my brothers and my sisters that they would have the grace, the supernatural help from you to wait as long as it takes for you to come in in a way that, that they recognize it is you. But God, I ask, you know, I know you can do it in a moment. And, uh, you know, I'm just remembering this picture, you know, you, you could, we could be sitting at a table right now and we could have a, a glass full of water sitting on the table and you and I could talk and debate all day long about that glass of water, if it's hot or if it's cold. And I could tell you it's hot. I'm sure it's hot. And you could say it's cold or I don't really even care. And the reality is until we actually stick our finger into that glass of water, we don't know for ourselves if it's hot or if it's cold. And so, Father, we are asking you to help us. You know what that looks like for each one of us. Help us to actually engage our hearts, engage our very lives to the point where we experience and encounter the truth for ourselves, that we would own the truth of who you are, Jesus. And Father, that that place that you're longing to bring us out of our past into the bright future that you have for us, a place and a, a, a future that's full of freedom, freedom from oppression, freedom from the demonic realm that that constantly wants to lie to us and and distract us into lesser loves than what you actually have for us. Um, we just give you permission right now to convict us. No shame, just true conviction. Highlight, spotlight in us places that we have not forgiven. You said, Jesus, when you were here, you prayed, um, you prayed on the cross, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. And you showed us our Father God's heart in that statement that that, that is your heart. You, we don't know, but you know. You are the best judge. And um, Jesus, you revealed the Father's heart that we would be forgiven, but you also prayed and you taught us to pray in the Lord's Prayer. You said, teach us to forgive as we forgive those. Forgive us as we forgive those who have wronged us. And so you you showed us that that to the degree that we are able to forgive others, to that same degree, you forgive us. 
And so we want to walk in forgiveness. We have so many things. In fact, before, before you reveal to us the things that we need to forgive, I ask that you would remind us of what you have forgiven us of. Every single one of us have needed to be forgiven for things maybe even today, maybe just yesterday, maybe some long-term things from our past. And you've forgiven us. And so we ask that as you reveal to us how you have forgiven us, that we would be able to forgive others who have wronged us and shut the door to the enemy and the demonic realm in our own lives. And God, for those who need to do that with someone one-on-one -on -one in prayer, God, I ask that you would just help them, help them head in that direction of of stepping out to find an ambassador who rep truly represents you, that can pray with them and speak truth and life into their hearts, into their lives. We're looking for you, Jesus. We're looking for you in others. And we're looking for you in our own lives. We want our own encounter with you. Reveal yourself, Jesus, to all who are sincerely asking today. And for those who aren't ready, God, I ask that you would just patiently remind them again when they are ready to invite you to reveal yourself to them. I know you can. I know you do. I've heard it countless times. And I thank you, Jesus, that you are Emmanuel. You are the God who is with us. You are present. You didn't just exist a long time ago, and you don't just exist in heaven. You are present with us now. We thank you for that. And Father, I pray for um, those who do already walk intimately with you. Would you remind us that we are your ambassadors? And would you, through our lives and through our words, plead, plead with those that we come in to relationship with, plead your heart for them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, well, um, as usual, I took you on, you know, one of these. I hope you were able to, to keep up with me. Sometimes, I'm sure you can tell, you know, I'm externally trying to listen and process. Um, and so it's not always like this linear way of presenting to you. But um, I do want to go back into that scripture sometime. I feel like there's so much more in that. For us and it might be next week we'll see um, and if you don't mind uh, subscribe I don't know if you're watching this on YouTube you can also hit the notification bell that helps you find out whenever a, a new video is posted on our channel here um, you can like and subscribe which helps us um, be seen more by others who haven't yet you know heard of restore seven um, and thank you so much for just the privilege of getting to speak into your hearts and your lives every week. And I'll see you again on Choose Love.